Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's very loud. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, we uh, are thrilled to be able to work with Nicolas. Uh, currently, he is the curator of our latest exhibition in Casa Guavi in Puerto Escondido, a, a solo show by uh, American Pakistani artist Uma Baba. We will talk a little bit about that at the end of the conversation. So this uh, was presented as a very good opportunity to talk about public art and how two institutions, one in New York and one in Oaxaca, the Public Art Fund and Casa Guavi, uh, approach the, the notion of public art and how that works as a catalyst for social development and change. So for this conversation, um, Nicolas, We'll uh, talk about the Public Art Fund in New York, and then we will talk about the more, um, uh, more specifically to, to the work we do at Casa Wabi in terms uh, of uh, public art and pavilions. So, Nicolas, thank you. Hello. Thanks so much, Alberto. Thank you for um, hosting and uh, for the amazing team at Casa Wabi. It's an absolute pleasure to, to work there um, and with such an extraordinary artist as Huma Baba. I hope uh, you'll all be able to, to go visit during the exhibition. And uh, thanks to, to the organizers here at, at Zona Marco. It's the first time I've come to Zona Marco, but not the first time I've come to Mexico City which uh, I come to any excuse I can. Uh, I think I first came here over 20 years ago uh, when I first started curating in the US. I'm Australian originally. One of the first exhibitions I did uh, when I started working in the US was with Francis Ellis. So uh, it was actually Francis's first exhibition, museum exhibition in the US. Uh, so I've got a long, um, long history of, of enjoying the art scene here in Mexico City. Uh, my background is as a museum curator, and of course now working with Public Art Fund, uh, I've sort of moved from the white cube to the outdoor space, which of course is the opposite of the white cube, where you know, in the museum space, you want to have everything as neutral and white and uh, so you can focus, you know, purely on the work of art. I mean, that's the concept. Um, and of course, in public space, you have all of the noise and activity and energy and people and noise and weather and sun and rain and hail and snow and I mean in Mexico you probably don't have snow in New York we do um, so it's just a, it's a, such a different context but also I think you know we feel very strongly that it's a context that the audience should have the possibility to experience art that is just as important by artists who are just as brilliant that you would see in New York City's great museums. So it's very much about a democratization and, uh, and also giving artists the opportunity to be a part of the civic dialogue. You know, artists' voices should not just be over here in the nice walls of the museum they should be a part of the society in every way. So we really believe in making the city a platform for artists. Uh, so I, I have some images here, um, just beginning a few composite um, screens. I d it's not a very big screen, so if, if people want to move closer to see the, the screen, please go ahead. Um, and also, of course, you can find a lot of these images on our website. Um, but this is kind of just some of the 
projects Public Art Fund has done over the years. Um, we were founded, the organization was founded in 1977. So uh, we've been working in the public space in New York City and, and other places as well, um, you know, for about 44 years now. And our program is very global. You know, we work with artists from all over the world. We work in all different kinds of mediums. Um, and uh, you know, these, um, I'll, I'll perhaps jump into a few specific exhibitions that might, uh, that might give you a sense of, of what we do and also this idea of kind of um, activating the social space. Uh, I, I put this slide in because this is actually one of the, it was the first exhibition I did at City Hall Park, which is one of Public Art Fund's regular sites. So we're a bit like a museum in the sense that we have our regular galleries, but they are in in New York City, not inside a building. So one of them is City Hall Park. Um, it's a beautiful park in downtown New York. And the first exhibition I did there was called Statuesque, and it was really looking at the way a younger generation of international artists were re-engaging figurative sculpture. And Huma Baba was one of the artists that I included, and this was actually her first piece uh, in public, first work she showed in public, uh, you know, outside uh, space. And it's, um, it's a great piece called The Orientalist. It's really a seminal work of hers. And so that was my first sort of time I really got to know uh, Huma. And it's been all this time, another 12 years, is it? Almost 11 um, since you know, now the opportunity to work with her at Casa um, And then to jump, jump forward a bit, maybe one of the uh, exhibitions that we did that uh, was, a, I think, a very interesting model of exhibition was with Ai Weiwei. Uh, and it was 2017, which was our 40th anniversary. So we wanted to do kind of a big citywide exhibition. Um, the idea of, of good fences make good neighbors uh, is it's a somewhat ironic term. I don't know if you're familiar with the line. It's actually um, from the, the poem Mending Wall, which is you know, one of the, the great sort of canonical American literary uh, references. And um, it's really, in a sense, about the small-mindedness of the belief that a wall, you know, or a fence can solve a problem. Uh, and, and so Weiwei's project was really to sort of take this motif of the fence and then, uh, which of course, at that moment in, you know, 2016, when, you know, we were sort of planning the exhibition and it started, uh, it was the, it was the time that um, then candidate Trump was talking about his wall between the US and Mexico and you know it was um, it became this huge issue I mean with the, the exhibition was conceived before that election campaign so we had no idea it would become so um, topical in a sense uh, but the the issue that had really way way had become passionate about was the um, really the refugee crisis, the global refugee crisis, and the fact that, of course, a lot of refugees were being put in, you know, into confinement camps in different places, behind fences. Um, anyway, um, the idea of this exhibition was really to use the city. This is Washington Square Park. Uh, this is Central Park. These were different kind of cage structures where the fence, you know, literally became a cage that you could enter into in Queens at the Unisphere, this, you know, historic image of the globe symbolizing this kind of idea of unity of nations. But here we are, you know, making fences between them. And this was um, a kind of 
structure that circumnavigated the, the globe, if you like, because it was kind of netting that then became a, a seating. So you could sit in this kind of, it was almost like a jungle gym kind of fencing. Um, there were fences on top of buildings, you know, it's kind of what is that? It wasn't even clear if it's a work of art, like it's just a strange fence that pops up around the city. Um, fences on buildings, this is the Cooper Union building. Um, so it was really, uh, we did fences on bus shelters that also were seats, so you could sit on it. And we also used the advertising space for the bus shelter, and that was images of refugees that, you know, had been taken by Weiwei and his team uh, around the world. So it was really about kind of connecting with the infrastructure of the city and in every borough. You know, it was in, of course, Manhattan, but it was Queens, Bronx, Brooklyn, Staten Island, I mean, everywhere. Um, and we used banners too, that's normally for advertising, and that sort of portraits of famous refugees who become, you know, iconic cultural figures in different ways. Uh, again, just all over the city. Um, jumping forward then, this is um, a project that we did with Tauber Auerbach. And Tauber uh, is an amazing artist, but you know, probably best known for her paintings. She works in a lot of different mediums and printing, books, you know, she makes all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, often it's hard or because we do a lot of sculptural projects, working with painters isn't always so easy. But this was a fantastic project because uh, we had the opportunity to, to work with a boat and so she kind of conceived this idea of uh, painting this boat, every aspect of it, you know, the interior, the exterior, all of the surfaces, and using the idea of flow separation, which is the kind of wake, you know, that, like, say, behind a boat, when something moves through water, the ripples that happen. So she studied a lot of the chemistry of that and then created a kind of, um, you know, a beautiful... Uh, uh, sort of replication of that effect, but using, you know, like drawing, uh, like marbling, drawing lines through ink. Uh, very beautiful, fascinating process. And then we, you know, had, had it uh, riding around New York in the harbor. People could come and uh, sort of go around, around the harbor. Really beautiful project. And this was a fireboat, so it's actually a retired fireboat, but it would turn on the sprinklers as well. It was a lot of fun. Um, this is a project we have up in New York right now. Uh, it's with the British artist Gillian Waring. Um, and this is really a, a kind of partnership, or done in, in partnership with her retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum. So we also love to partner with the New York museums uh, and, and to do a public work to amplify, you know, what they're doing, say, with an artist. And uh, so Gillian conceived, this is Central Park, the entrance to Central Park. This is another one of our regular sites uh, that she wanted, um, you know, she has a series of artists who are great influences on her uh, and Diane Arbus is one of them. So, of course, Arbus's, some of Arbus's most famous photographs were taken in Central Park, and she lived on Central Park. So Gillian's idea was to kind of return her to Central Park, uh, to put her right there, just standing there as if, you know, you might have met her when she was, you know, looking, taking photographs. Uh, and it's, it's sort of an interesting project because it, and it's a bronze, uh, just with a bronze patina, except for the shoes, and the shoes are painted. That's one little, it's this kind of funny moment that makes you um, stop for a second. I, I don't know if we have a good photo 
where you see the shoe. I mean, you can kind of see the white uh, shoes there. And when we opened it, people thought, uh, some people thought it was one of those mimes that's just standing. <laughs> and people would come up and just sort of be like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of course it's bronze, so. Uh, but, and, and then we have uh, Gillian chose a quote from Arbus to, to have um, sort of in, in the pavement next to the statue. Uh, so I think, you know, that's an interesting way too that public art can, um, well, of course, right now it's a, there's a big debate about monuments, you know, who gets to be memorialized. There are very few statues of women in Central Park. There are even fewer statues of artists uh, of any gender. So, uh, you know, in a way this participates in that dialogue, but it also rethinks how a monument can function. It's not on a pedestal. Uh, it's a very kind of humble presentation in that, you know, she's, she's just kind of wearing like normal clothes and just kind of in her work of making photographs. Um, so it was also interesting. I and mean, this is temporary. So, you know, all of the projects we do in these spaces are temporary. So that's also about the dynamism of uh, a kind of temporary exhibition program. Uh, so then this is a show that we also have on right now, which um, follows on actually from the Ai Weiwei exhibition where we used the bus shelter advertising. Because the company that we worked with that gave us the space is J.C. Deco. Actually, I noticed their name is on the wall here. So they must be involved um, also with Zona Marco. I mean, they're a very um, enlightened company. Um, and they really like the idea of having art as a part of, uh, you know, giving some of their advertising space to, to art. So they loved the Weiwei project and then we agreed to kind of develop an ongoing program. So now twice a year, they give us uh, bus shelter space. And actually now it's, um, it's grown from New York. It's also in Chicago and Boston. So it's a really wonderful way to have a kind of multi-city exhibition. So we have 320 bus shelters right now in those three cities. And this is a sh this, we usually alternate between a solo show where it's just one artist doing multiple works. Martin Gutierrez was the last show. And then um, this new show is a, is a group of a very global group of artists. We really thought at this point in the pandemic that we wanted to kind of re-engage globally and also we learned a lot about how to work across borders when you can't travel. And the beauty in a sense of the bus shelter project is all we need is a JPEG, you know, because it's a printed image. So as long as someone can send us a JPEG, we can turn it into one of these prints uh, to put in the, in the bus shelters. So we wanted to engage this global group and really artists whose voices we haven't heard, but whose voices we sort of felt like we needed to hear and wanted to hear, that would have different perspectives, knowing too that the pandemic experience has been so different depending on what part of the world you're in and continues to be you know, access to medicine, access to vaccines, and, you know, all the rest of it. Um, so this was nominators from all around the world that we invited to sort of suggest artists. And the team, my two colleagues, Dan Palmer, Katerina Stathopoulou, and myself then selected the artists, and we had our own sort of nominations as well. And then these are the 20 artists that we chose. Uh, and so these are just a few, uh, this show just opened, so we only have a few installation shots. Um, this is Walid al-Wawi, which it's probably impossible to read the text, but it's just a text in English and Arabic. Um, and the, um, the text um, 
Can I remember it? It's, it's really about um, the impossibility of, uh, or the sort of racism inherent in a way in translation. Um, it says, um, we don't speak your language, they said in their language. So some of the works are kind of conceptual and text-based like that. This is uh, the work by Tony Albert, who's an indigenous Australian artist who uh, collects a lot of sort of Aboriginal memorabilia and kind of kitsch from the 50s and 60s with images of, you know, Aboriginal motifs. And this is then a kind of collage made out of those fabrics and, and so forth. So it's a kind of... Um, and it makes reference also to kind of modernist use of Aboriginal images from the 30s and 40s in Australia, uh, but also it's just kind of very accessible, beautiful image. Um, Miriam uh, Boulos, who's a Lebanese artist based in, uh, in Beirut. So this is all about kind of female fantasy which she's interested in exploring. It's kind of the first in a new series. Um, this is Sean Connolly, who's um, and the only kind of US artist in the show, but is indigenous from Oahu. Um, uh, Nolan Dennis, um, South African artist, super interesting kind of idea of, of worlds and networks, very suitable for a bus you know, shelters, Pushpa Kumari, amazing, very sort of traditional artist or who inherited this kind of traditional technique in India, but really reinventing it with contemporary imagery about, this is actually about vaccination. Um, uh, this is Rosina Polino, Brazilian artist, about sort of destruction of the environment in, in the Amazonas and uh, parts of Brazil. Um, uh, Denise Perez from Dominican Republic. I mean, just see, it's like a really interesting mix. Jason Fu from Melbourne, Australia. Um, lots of different... Um, uh, Abel Rodriguez, also indigenous artists. We had, I think, five or six indigenous artists in the exhibition. Um, so we're really kind of wanting... Oh, Kayleen Whiskey, she's another like, very uh, amazing... Um, indigenous Australian artist. Uh, so, and Rufai Zakri. Uh, then another sort of initiative that we have, aside from our exhibition program, are is what we call creative partnerships, where we work with another entity um, that wants to create a public art program uh, usually permanent commissions. And so we, you know, have been in, in the last few years kind of working on some of these um, uh, projects. So uh, Rafael Lozano Hemmer, who's an artist I'm sure uh, that, that is familiar to Mexican audience, um, he did this fantastic piece in Washington, D.C. for a new museum there that's all about language. Uh, so the piece is a is a sort of compendium of international languages that is it, th these kind of flowers that are hanging or these bells are actually speakers and they're motion activated so when you walk under one of the speakers you hear the language of one of the world's languages there's like 190 something different bells and each one speaks a different language um, so it's called speaking willow so that's a permanent piece now. Um, the new terminal at LaGuardia Airport is another one of these projects. Um, so there's benches uh, and balloons by Yepa Hein. Um, there's a, an amazing sort of enormous um, window piece by Sabine Hornig, the German artist based in Berlin, which is a transparency um, uh, that, that's a kind of fantasy uh, reinvention, in a way, of the New York skyline, but inverted, and, and well, it's kind of a multi-view. And she also included quotations from Fiorello LaGuardia, who's actually, whose you know, words have a lot of resonance today. 
Um, and this just gives you a sense. It almost turns this very large connector that would just be an anonymous kind of, you know, um, circulation space in an airport into almost like a cathedral with stained glass window, you know, with the light streaming in. Very um, spectacular and, and beautiful and meaningful piece. Because uh, I didn't think a lot of people even know LaGuardia was actually a person and who were they and what did they do, you know. Um, this is an amazing uh, work by Laura Owens. Uh, also, obviously, you know, best known as a painter, but I really thought that Laura could do something incredible with, with a wall. Um, and so she made this tile mural and it... Um, so it's a kind of sky, it's like this sort of sky space with icons of New York City floating uh, amidst the clouds. And it's, um, it's huge, it's over 400 feet long and it goes, you know, several stories high. You can see it kind of going down below that kind of uh, void space. And it's just incredibly playful and fun, there's sort of high art, objects and images, there's everyday images, um, you know, things like an ice cream cart, a pizza slice, a hot dog, uh, all, all of these things, you know, floating. You can, you can see how big the wall is too in the background. And then in the foreground here, um, you see this beautiful sphere that Sarah Z made, um, which is sort of very typical of her work, you know, she's New York based, um, artist where everything looks like this kind of very like torn pieces of paper very fragile clipped together but this is actually a kind of multi-ton metal sculpture you know that, that she kind of created to to give the appearance of that all of that fragility so these you know appear, apparently ripped paper photographs are actually pieces of metal all silk screened um, so it's a really incredible uh, you uh, trompe l'oeil in a sense. Um, then another big project we just did like this is at the new uh, Penn Station building, the Moynihan Train Hall. And um, this is a super important project in New York because if you've ever been to Penn Station, uh, you, you know that it's like the worst place ever. It's like just a complete mess. Uh, but this wonderful new building, which was the post office, is just across the street on 8th Avenue. And now it's been transformed into kind of another uh, access to, to all the platforms. Stan Douglas, the brilliant um, uh, Canadian artist, so representing Canada in Venice this year, uh, sort of recreated the original Penn Station that was destroyed. It was an amazing Bazaar building and he used CGI animation to recreate the, um, the original building and then sort of photographed scenes that he then sort of wove into that CGI animation. It's, it's a really spectacular feat of, um, you know, kind of digital manipulation because you cannot believe that it isn't like photographs taken in the original building. And the destruction of that building is really what launched the preservation movement in New York because uh, it was such a scandal people couldn't believe that this majestic building was just sort of destroyed. Um, and then there's a piece that's kind of at one of the two um, sort of side entrances to the building, main entrances on 31st Street and 33rd Street. This is Elm Green and Dragset, the um, Berlin-based artists and it's a kind of also fic fictitious city that's inverted hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it's kind of very monumental, it's hard to grasp the scale of it, it's absolutely sort of massive and it's also um, a light piece because there's lighting inside it so it, it's kind of, um, it, it's an amazing work the way it sort of occupies the space sculpturally and creates this glow and um, very much about the sort of energy, it's called the hive. So it's that sense of like, um, you know, a city as this thriving 
thing that's that's the synergy of all of the different elements, all of the people, if you like, us bees that are buzzing around. Um, and then there's an incredible stained glass window piece by Kehinde Wiley. Uh, Kehinde, obviously another painter, uh, but known most as a painter, and for very static, sort of monumental, grand paintings. Uh, but I thought he might have an interesting idea for this ceiling, and he really did, and created this um, stained glass piece, which is not like these, his static sort of monumental paintings. It's a very um, sort of joyful, colorful, vibrant, dynamic piece that actually pictures break dancers. So, you know, break dancing was invented in, on the streets of New York. So, you know, what could more express the, um, you know, the, the sort of character of New York? And you, so you, instead, of, of course, it's a riff on, you know, Tiepolo-esque, uh, you know, uh, Rococo ceilings. But here, instead of the, uh, all of the, you know, allegorical figures floating across the sky, it's real break dances that he photographed and then created in this image. So, uh, really stunning piece. Uh, okay, so I think that's everything I was going to show you, just to kind of give you like a sense of um, how we work. Thank you. Eh, ¿Podemos poner la presentación de Wabi, por favor? Um, so we're going to talk about, uh, m m m many of you probably know Fundación Casawabi. Uh, we are a non-profit foundation that opened in 2014 in Puerto Escondido, Oaxaca. And now we have a venue in Mexico City, which is, uh, we're moving to the, a new venue that will be open in April and in Japan, a residency in Japan. Um, this uh, foundation was opened, as I said, in 2014 by a uh, Mexican artist, Bosco Sodi. And uh, the main mission of the foundation is to uh, engage in uh, social development through art. So we do that by, with five programs. Uh, the, perhaps the most famous one or the, or the one that you hear the most is the residencies program. But we also have an exhibitions program clay program that we we um, we uh, develop the, the the use of clay for uh, aesthetic purposes a mobile library and a film program in the region so through uh, with these five programs we work with 13 communities in the uh, between Puerto Escondido and Rio Grande in uh, Oaxaca and as I said, in Mexico City and Tokyo. Uh, for us, it's very, very important that all our programs, all, all our um, activities have a community uh, a participation or they go to the development of the community. So we, uh, we really focus all... Uh, can I have the clicker? Thank you. We focus all our mission to uh, bring artists and to develop uh, art projects for the benefit of the communities that we work with. Uh, the, 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 the image that you see here is uh, the house, the main house, which is a Tadao Ando <coughs> building. It's Japanese architect. And this is main palapa and is the center of, the, of the, uh, all our uh, social life for the, for the residents as well as office work and is and, 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 uh, yeah, it's sort of the main point of the foundation. Uh, focusing on public art and public buildings, I'm going to talk about today of two uh, main uh, discourses that we do, how we do public art. The first one is through the development of pavilions in Casawabi, in the grounds of Casawabi. All these uh, uh, pavilions are built usually with a a specific purpose. They uh, have to be useful and they have to be um, a tool for the development of, of our programs. This one uh, is Pabellón del Guayacán. Guayacán is this species, it's a protected species of plant wi uh, 
with a, a lot of medicinal purposes. And it's very difficult to grow Guayacan in some regions. And actually, Bosco found out that uh, it grows very easily in the, in the ground. So he, uh, he commissioned uh, Ambrosi Chegaray, this architect studio from Mexico City, to build this pavilion. We also uh, organized a UMA, uh, which is a government permission to grow and uh, commercialize these trees. So it is important to say that we give these trees for the community, so we give them for free, and if there is someone that would like to purchase that is not for a community uh, goal, then we, we, uh, we sell it. So we grow uh, the Guayacanes, and it's very interesting to see how Ambrose, uh, Gabriela and, and Jorge, and, and, uh, they enter, you enter the pavilion uh, in, in where the table is. That table is also for the children that visit the community uh, three times a week. And then you get to see the different uh, layers of Guayacanes. So you actually see them on the eye level is where they are growing and they go from the from the smallest one to the to the largest ones at the end of the of the pavilion. This photo obviously was taken at the moment when we open. It's completely different now in the way that it has a lot of vegetation. The Guayacanes have been growing very nicely as well and the water of the gr of the of the area that we found in the wells in the area has a lot of oxides. So it actually turns everything brown. And this is very interesting because a lot of artists have used this, um, uh, yeah, this, this attribution of the water for aesthetic purposes. And the concrete for this pavilion is now turning uh, brown as well, so, uh, which is something that the architects also expect, expected. And it gives a very interesting idea and relationship with the landscape. This is, uh, we call them the pavilion, but it's actually an uh, uh, art piece. We also have a selection of public sculptures in the gardens, and they have to work with uh, materials and, and elements from the region uh, and, and in a sort of organic way, and they have to dialogue as well with, with the, the nature and the landscape of both the sea and the mountains. This is a Bosco Sol installation with 60 cubes made out of bricks, <coughs> sorry, and it becomes this piece of uh, land art as well as minimum art that dialogues with the landscapes of, of as I said, both a uh, mountain and a uh, sea. Also, uh, for, for the work of Bosco, it has been very important um, evolution. Casa Guave has played a very important influence in the evolution of his work. And since he's been, uh, since we opened Casa Wabi, he's been including the use of clay in, in, the, in his work. You probably have seen the clay cubes that are only one piece, as well as the spheres. He wanted to do a very large size single piece, but obviously for the way the clay works and how we burn the clay in the region with the kilns, it was very difficult, so he changed his process to build it with um, with uh, with bricks. <coughs> this is our second pavilion. As I said before, all our pavilions have a uh, goal of, the, uh, of of for the programs that we use. This is Alvaro Sisa, who is a Portuguese architect, also another Pritzker Prize. Uh, we have two. Uh, Pritzker prizes, and next year we actually will have a third one. And this is the clay pavilion. It's done with uh, bricks from uh, Aguasarca, which is one of the communities that we work with, and it's a community that produces brick and tiles as a main source of uh, economic activity. And with the develop with the construction of this pavilion. We decide. We open the uh, clay program, and the clay program. The idea of the, of the goal of the clay program is that people in the region learn or relearn how to use clay uh, beyond building uh, tiles 
and, and brick. So it, we give this aesthetic purpose to the material that they already know, but also they have already lost in generations. So all the generations work with clay, but younger generations, because of social and economic processes, they migrate. So we want to give these tools, which is basically the tools that the, their family had, back to, to the younger generations. You see two palapas, the largest palapa is the uh, area for work. We have a large concrete table and you see a cube uh, in the in the semicircular uh, wall and that's the kiln that we use to burn uh, both children and uh, resident pieces. Another uh, uh, Pavilion is, is one of the latest one we had, is Alberto Kalac uh, high temperature kiln. This is right next to the clay pavilion by Alvaro Sisa, and it's a tower, it's a circular chimney tower um, that contains the high temperature kiln that we actually just, the, 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 the tower was built two years ago, but we actually finally brought back uh, the, the kiln and we started to work with the, with the high temperature kiln for uh, residents as well as the clay program. It's also important to say that the garden for Casawa was designed as well by Alberto Calac with uh, ethnobotanical uh, attributes. Another pavilion is the Pavilion de Composta, the Compost Pavilion by Solano Benitez and Gloria Cabral. They used to be a Studio Gabinete de Arquitectura. They are not uh, a study anymore. And this we, we, we obviously uh, build different types of compost for uh, Casa Wabi as well as the other houses and hotels uh, nearby. It's a concrete uh, structure with um, these sort of tiles that also contain red bricks. So you see there is a pattern as well of the materials that we use. is usually palapa, bricks, concrete, uh, and wood. <coughs> the, the chicken cup uh, was built by Kengo Kuma, who, uh, among many other things, he was the architect of the Olympic stadium, uh, stadium in Tokyo in the, for the Olympics. And this is a chicken co-op for our, uh, for the hens and, and chickens that we have and, and give us delicious eggs uh, in a way of also going to growing into a sustain sustainability uh, mission. And now I'm going to move a little bit to the, to the pieces. This is the latest artwork that we, uh, together with a piece by Uma, that I don't have a photo here because we did this before. They're installing Uma's piece today, actually. Uh, this is Waterfall, is Hugo Rondinone's uh, first uh, piece from this series. It's a 4.5 meters tall uh, column of concrete, a sort of a totem that contains plants. It's a vertical garden, it's alive, and it has a system of water pump that brings water up to the top and then it falls down as a waterfall every 10 minutes during every two hours. Uh, this has been a fantastic challenge in trying to, to basically grow the plants. We started to building in, in August and we finally have come to see this green. This is a photo from last, from last week. So it will obviously grow more, but uh, we are thrilled to have this, this, um, this piece. At, uh, Man, most of the other pieces and pavilions are in the gardens. This one is actually between uh, the sea and the residents' houses. So residents actually get to see it from any any point of the in the in the in the bungalows. This is wall. This is one of the pieces by Bosco that he the first edition that he did following a little bit of uh, the Ai Weiwei piece as well in Washington Square. He did a similar wall piece, uh, if I'm not wrong, in 2018, uh, or 19, sorry, 19, in Washington Square Park as well. It was a brick uh, wall, and then people will come and take one brick, and then the wall will be uh, slowly disappearing. He replicated that piece with this uh, 
marble in the middle of the garden in 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 Casa Wabi. Uma Boa Ordem uh, is also piece by Lucia Koch and Hector Zamora. Uh, he, as you know, you probably know, Hector Zamora uses lattice work and he has been explore, experimenting and exploring the use of lattice both in Brazil and now in, in Mexico City. He had the Met Rooftop Commission uh, last year and, and uh, it was a semicircular wall as well made out of lattice. This one was originally produced for Marco Museum in Monterrey and Hector and Lucia donated it to the foundation and we opened it in 2019 as well. <coughs> you probably have seen Bosco's Cubes. Uh, this is a collaboration between Izumi Kato, Japanese artist who had an exhibition at Casa Wabi in 2019. And Bosco, Izumi came back, for he came as an artist for exhibition and then he came back as a resident, and during his residency, he asked Bosco if he could collaborate to do this of, uh, sort of ghost-like uh, sculptures in, in the garden as well. Lori Gros is a French artist uh, who uh, buried uh, nine of his earliest sculptures in the park, in the, sorry, in the garden. You don't get to see them. You know, we know they are there. Uh, this is very funny because we asked Casa why we went, didn't get to see the pieces as well because they are in these boxes. So in a bit of a Manzoni act, we trust they are there. And uh, there are nine the, uh, sculptures buried in the garden in a very specific area of the garden. So you have this sort of soul or you get this uh, spirit of the work. The this is the second part. The first part is all the works that we have within Casa Wabi, and this is the works that we have produced in collaboration with the artists in residence. And I'm going to explain a little bit. The, the residency program, we bring artists from all over the world to work with the members of the co 13 communities for six weeks, and they develop a program, uh, sorry, a project that will benefit the community. And most of these projects have been uh, workshops of experiences or that, that it's a, it's a, it we have had 340 residents, so it's very multidisciplinary. But some of these projects have also uh, built uh, pieces that um, are st they stay in the communities. We don't build artworks that the residents take with themselves, but they actually have to be for the benefit of the town. So, for example, La Casa de Cultura de Puerto Escondido, uh, has all, we have had a close collaboration with them. Uh, it is important to say that the closest museum for these communities before Casa Wabi was seven hours away. We're talking about Oaxaca capital. You have to travel seven hours to visit a museum, to visit a gallery. They have libraries, but they didn't have a cinema at the time that we opened. Uh, now there is a commercial uh, cinema in uh, in the in Puerto, so we work with these allies as well to bring uh, to bring and to build with them uh, these these projects. This is uh, Lake Berea on the on the left, a Lake Berea uh, portrait that uh, they donated to the Casa de Cultura, and on the right is a Jean Sebastian Grégoire sculpture as well. That they are permanent sculptures, and they have been donated to them. We obviously. Uh, follow the process and we uh, work closely with them so they don't get uh, damaged uh, but it's actually their whole responsibility and donation. Uh, we also have been working in a line called Casa, uh, Casa Guaviento Escuela and we have focused on the doing projects within the schools and to actually develop the infrastructure of the school with public interventions this is one example. This is the, the primary school from Aguasarca, the town I told you that produces bricks and tiles. And it was very interesting that their primary school was made out of concrete. There was not a single brick in a town that produced bricks. So Diego Rivero Borrell, who is an architect with TANAT, did this playground on the lower uh, right side. Four children, Elsa Luis Manso, 
uh, did a series of paintings uh, with a um, timetable for one of the classrooms. And Gabriela Galvan, who was one of our first residents, also worked in a collective mural uh, made out of clay for the classrooms. Uh, this is also a piece that, that it, it's also, well, we've been working for seven years and we also get requirement uh, or petitions from the communities. The town, this is a town called Hidalgo, it's actually the closest town to, to Casawabi and they wanted to use the federal, the, sorry, the state money that they give to these uh, to the small towns to do a garden in the main square of the of the town so they com they ask us if we can build a sculpture and we propose this to Timon Aseri who is an Iranian German artist and he together with them with the members of the town developed this uh, guardian uh, also known as Tlaloc and this photo is before the garden now there is a garden and a and a, and a fountain that surrounds this, this sculpture and it's very interesting to see that because it's very bright, you can see it from anywhere in the town. This is a 600 people town, so it's, it's, it's very valuable to see that they have now they, they, this piece. And this is actually such a tiny town, it has about six other artworks, uh, either in walls, in the library for children, we have a reading pavilion, uh, we also have a sculpture in the primary school of this town. And these are other examples as well, for example in, in Zapotalito, which is a, a community right next to the uh, Manialtepec Lagoon. Uh, in this primary school we have murals as well uh, by Mike Cunahan. We had a sculpture, two sculptures by Adeline de Monseigne and Pablo de la Borde, as well as this uh, hammock. Uh, net by Paulina Almeida. Some of them are ephemeral and we know they are going to disappear and as I said before, all the other ones we, together with the institution, have the responsibility to, to preserve them. This is another uh, school in Manuel Tepec with pieces by Alvaro Garte, Daniel Monroy, Fabiola Torres Alzaga, Nuria Montiel and Ala Villavicencio. All of these artists also are, especially in this one, they are Mexican some of them emerging artists, so it's, for example, Alan Villavicencio, who is usually a painter, he started to do clay, uh, red clay pieces uh, at Casa Wabi, and then he did this mural with, with clay pieces, and now he's developing this uh, practice into his work. So it's also a very interesting dialogue and exchange. And, well, that's it. Thank you. Should we open for questions? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, first, I have a question for you. Uh, how are you funded? Is it uh, New York City that funds all the projects, or? Well, thank you for that question because I didn't make that clear. Um, Public Art Fund's an independent not-for-profit, so uh, we raise most of our funding through philanthropy. Uh, it's really typical of the US system. You know, most public institutions in the cultural area are funded, uh, you know, maybe has a public mission, but a private uh, funding structure. So we are exactly the same. So we're not a city agency or a city organization. Of course, to a lot of people in a lot of countries, if something is called public art fund, you would assume that it is a publicly funded thing, but it's, uh, but it's not. I mean, of course, we, get, we do get grants, you know, we apply for grants to different, but I mean, as a percentage of our annual budget, it's very, very tiny. Uh, the same, we're private uh, funding. Uh, we have also got public grants and, and, and the support of the Oaxacan government. Uh, the state government of Oaxaca has been very supportive in the last years. But mostly it's private uh, fundraising. 
and public and private grants as well. And we start to do slowly, for example, tours for us, giving and uh, charging for the tours is a great source of income that really helps us. And we, t we, we, we want to be more sustainable. We don't want to be dependent as well on, on, on public funding, for example. So we are also in this process of trying to be as independent as possible. Oh, hello. Uh, I would like to know uh, more about the way you choose the works of art to be shown in the public areas. Do you have uh, a space in which uh, particip participation of, a, of, a, of other um, opinions by, but, but yours, uh, but, but the, 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 that participate in the, in the, in the selection of the, of the works of art? Thank you. Um, you know, I, th I think one of the things that we love to do is invite artists to develop a proposal that's site specific. So we don't approach an artist and just say, you know, we want to show your work and choose something they already created. We also don't just say, we want you to do something. It's going to be in January next year and now just go do it. Um, because these projects can take any number of years to develop. Um, because I always feel like there's no point in sort of setting a deadline for a creative project. Um, well, a deadline can be useful to sort of generate ideas. But until you actually have a proposal that is something that everyone wants to kind of move forward with, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of like a child. It just has to be nurtured until it's ready, you know, to go uh, out into the world. So our curatorial process is kind of a little different to, I guess, a typical museum process in that sense. Um, but it's very similar to a museum process in that we, are, we have a professional curatorial team and it's you know, the responsibility of the curatorial team to uh, develop the artistic program. So we research, we travel, we go to art fairs and exhibitions and studios and, um, and in the case of the uh, global positioning exhibition, you know, invited nominators because we knew that, of course, like to reach such a diverse group of international artists in a very short space of time, um, you know, why not reach out to our colleagues? And I think the pandemic has also kind of refreshed a sense of collaboration and the possibilities of, you know, working with our colleagues and fellow institutions and you know, working in different ways. Um, so, you know, it's, um, I guess it's, it's a kind of curatorial process. We don't take open calls. We don't um, accept, you know, unsolicited submissions. Uh, but it's, it's also a process that can be very fluid and, you know, can take many years or very few. There was a question over here. Yes. I didn't mean to cut you off if you were about to answer. Okay. Um, so I really enjoyed this, uh, both of you, so thank you a lot. One of the reasons I think I enjoyed it is that um, I'm someone who goes to a museum and I read everything on the walls or I get an audio, the audio tour. And I've always been interested in people who don't do any of that reading and they just kind of go through and experience the curation as maybe from more of an emotional standpoint or they have unanswered questions. And so what I realized, so I've been living in New York for about five years and what this made me realize is that I think I've been the wandering museum goer without the explicit curation. And so I'm wondering as a curator and I see now when I've seen these independent things, I've wondered things like is it propaganda or is this an artist and it's funded when there's like a social message? Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering as for both of you also as curators um, in this 
public space and comparing kind of the white wall box that you talked about at the beginning, how much do you think about the fact that people don't know where this is? Mo I think maybe most people, uh, like I'm the average New York citizen going around. Um, how much do you think about the fact that nobody gets that much insight into all these things that you're talking about that are curated? Well, in a specific uh, case of Casa Wabi, uh, we produce or develop each of these pieces together with the community. So it's not only about building something, but it's actually having an exchange in how these things get built. And it's something that it belongs both to the artist and the members of the communities that they are I installed. So is y as you see, in, in some of these pieces, they are not pieces that you can actually, some of them, go and see them. You know, these ones, these four ones are within one school, so they're for the children. And they've been working with the with children, and they've been working with the parents, and they've been working with the professors to get these pieces done. In the case of Casa Wabi, uh, we give the tour, and then you have a guided tour around these pieces. So we give as much information as we can. We're actually in the process of changing our web page and also ev evolving the visitor experience so people get as much information as they can on the works that we show and the pavilions that we, that we have. Uh, it, it is a, it's a super interesting question because as also trained as a museum curator where you, as, you, know, you have your introductory wall text and your labels and everything is, you know, and, and if you go to a museum, you know you're there. I mean, you've walked in the door, you like, I'm at Momo or whatever it is. If you just see one of our projects, like you say, you might not even know, is this a work of art? I mean, hopefully you probably think it is, but, but you know, maybe not. Um, and so uh, that, that does create a very different dynamic. I mean, we do a lot of work to create the opportunity to find out more information. So we do do signage with our exhibitions we do also have a very robust website um and you know you, you, we use hashtags and um uh, qr codes and you know all kinds of different things to help people kind of go further so um but there's no guarantee that you can do that and i think the there's two really good things about that one is that artists um also realize they have to change their mode of address uh, and they have to think differently both in a material sense, right? Because if you create something for a gallery space at a certain scale and then you put it outside, it just shrunk by 50%. So, you know, the way things function in outdoor space is also very different physically and, you know, all the things they have to endure, the weather, the love of the public, um, you know, all of those things, right? It, it's sort of, you just, you, you have to think differently and you have to think also that someone has to be able to just see this and not read anything and be able to connect. And I think what's super exciting is it's very hard. I mean, it is really, really difficult to create a great public art piece much harder than creating, you know, a great work to go in a museum or a gallery. And so it pushes artists who are ambitious and, you know, what artist doesn't want an audience, right? That's, artists want the world to see, you know, everything through their eyes. And so it's kind of exciting and terrifying at the same time uh, because it's so hard to, to really kind of do it in a way that kind of works on all of those levels and is kind of a great work of art, not just something with a message or not propaganda or not just decorative. Like, you know, it has to somehow, you know, be true to the artist's own, like, aesthetic vision, but kind of recreated for public space. And what I've seen is that artists, when they do that, it sort of opens up a whole lot of new doors in their thinking and in their working. 
So it can be very generative, you know, produce whole bodies of work through that one challenge to create a public work. So, so you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's complicated <coughs> and it's a constant, you know, struggle, for instance, like more people probably see public art funds, exhibitions than go to any New York museum far fewer people know that they're seeing a public art fund exhibition because you're not walking through a door saying, you know, public art fund. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting challenge. Thanks. I also enjoyed the talk a lot. I think I had a reaction a bit like the last speaker um, that when I was looking at the um, piece of Diane Arbus, um, naturalist uh, uh, in in the setting where she grew up um, uh, I had the feeling of it's being kind of a mirror and that the um, uh, piece isn't just honoring uh, the artist but the piece is also honoring the public that recognized her and uh, and nurtured her uh, and so I, I, I just really appreciated that twist yeah, I, it's, it's that, in a way, that way that um, the layers of the history of a place can sort of be resurfaced. Because I think we have such short memories and, you know, every, every, all of those layers of history of the people who, you know, made the history and, and made the culture what it is today, including the audience, um, like all get forgotten and so when a piece like that like reappears i was amazed because diane arbus no nobody knows what diane arbus looked like she wasn't a celebrity you know she didn't like she didn't get photographed herself you know she wanted to be on that side of the camera but somehow there is this idea of diane arbus in people's heads so when they see the statue of this woman holding a, uh, clearly it's a very particular camera from a particular period, people sort of think, oh, that's Diane Arbus. How do they know? Nobody knows what she looks at, you know. So it's like, it's a fascinating kind of phenomenon of what our, the way our mind actually recognizes something even when we have no idea what it actually looked like. Um, so, it's, so it is kind of a, like a really interesting excavation of the collective memory. Any other question? No? Well, Nicolas, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Albert. Thank you. And uh, we'll invite everyone to come and s to Puerto Escondido and see Nicolas exhibition with Uma Baba that is opening um, this Saturday and it will be throughout this year until January 2023. So if you have the chance, please visit Casa Baba in Puerto Escondido. And thank you everyone for coming.